3. Horace Mann and the Messianic Character of American Education The Messianic Character of American Education received its direction from Horace Mann, 1796-1858, aptly called the Father of the Common Schools. It would be easy to point out that European educators have surpassed man in maintaining that these schools are the means, instruments, vehicles and true church by which salvation is given to society. The marked difference between conventional and American educational theory has been that continental Europe often developed its schools with either a specifically anti-Christian impetus or a post-Christian concept of society, whereas in America for some time, both because of inherent developments and as a result of man's work, education presented its aims as the fulfilment of Christianity. In the controversies with the churches, man's stand was basically this, that true religion would best be served for the schools and that the churches were in error in their interpretation of their faith and its realm. Man himself was an active and earnest churchman. In Europe, the parochial school was identified with the Christian religion, the public school in many areas with organised and militant secularism, atheism and anti-clericalism. In either extreme, however, education remained messianic in purpose and character. But no understanding of the American school situation is possible without a recognition of the devout and ostensibly Christian intents in its origins. Man was a faithful churchgoer and a man who spoke religiously of education. His sympathy and theology were Unitarian, but to understand this fact it is necessary to recognise that in the early 19th century Unitarianism had not yet as it was to do subsequently separated itself from Christianity. Rather, it presented itself as the true version of Christianity and the fulfilment of Protestantism. It was not yet sufficiently divergent from other groups to be beyond the pale. And man's election to the presidency of Antioch College in later years is not too surprising. That college, begun as a denominational school of the Christian Church, could call a known Unitarian without any surprise on either side. Indeed, man considered Antioch's establishment as a great forward step in that it was free from Calvinist orthodoxy and could thus constitute breaking a hole in the wall and letting in the light of religious civilization where it had never shone before. For him, Calvinism was sectarianism and anything else in varying degrees, Catholic and libertarian. This was a common opinion in his day, when not infrequently an equal hatred was reserved for Calvinism and atheism, both constituting blasphemy to many ostensible Christians. The orthodox Calvinism of the day had provided man his home church training, his childhood pastor being the beloved Nathaniel Emmons, a kindly and genial man. Yet man later described, The inward joy of my youth blighted by Emmons' teaching and doctrine. That the Calvinism of the age was defective is clear-cut, but had it not been so, man's antagonism would have remained. Man was, as Williams points out, a thorough believer in the doctrine of the perfectibility of man. In contrast to all Puritan and Calvinist thought, for him religion was essentially moralism rather than piety. And yet man could hark back to the Puritan fathers of New England and consider himself their truer descendant than the current Calvinists. This is a point of no small significance. Both the contemporary Calvinists and the Unitarians felt themselves to be legitimate heirs of the Puritans in religious faith. How was this construed to be true? The Calvinists claimed a theological affinity. They were both committed to the Westminster Standard and a common body of divinity or doctrine. Man, however, and other Unitarians felt they had no less a claim. The difference lay in their respective interpretations of Christianity. 
For the Calvinists, it was essentially a salvation religion. For the Unitarians, it was essentially a libertarian religion. So interpreted by the Unitarians, the Puritans broke with the past and its bondage to create a new and freer society, and America represented the great forward step of Puritan Protestant Christianity. The spirit of freedom was the essence of Christianity, and Christianity so construed rendered the current Calvinists retrogressive, reactionary and unchristian. The Calvinist approach to Christianity was theological, the Unitarian and man's was anthropological. Thus, a product of Christian faith and society was absolutized and made the essence of that faith, thereby destroying it. The disintegrating character of Unitarianism was inevitable because of this confusion. Man, in his prospectus, of the Common School Journal, November 1838, identified Protestant Christianity with freedom. It has always tended towards free institutions and hence needs public schools to survive. Political equality requires an equality of education and character and hence public schools are a necessity. The Pilgrim Fathers very early required the education of every child the General Court in 1642, declaring that parents failing to obey would be fined. The purpose of the act being to see first that none of them shall suffer so much barbarism in any of their families. Commented man. Such was the idea of barbarism entertained by the colonists of Massachusetts Bay more than two centuries ago. The Pilgrims, Puritans and Unitarians were thus at one in their libertarian impetus and America was to prosper and become a heaven on earth only as this essential Christianity prospered and freedom found greater sway through education. Since this implicit interpretation of Christianity was anthropological, the natural realm was of more immediate interest as an arena of revelation than the supernatural. Accordingly, natural law looms large in man's thinking. I believe in the existence of a great, immortal, immutable principle of natural law or natural ethics, a principle antecedent to all human institutions and incapable of being abrogated by any ordinance of man, a principle of divine origin clearly legible in the ways of providence, as those ways are clearly manifested in the order of nature and in the history of the race, which proves the absolute right to an education of every human being that comes into the world, and which of course proves the correlative duty of every government to see that the means of that education are provided for all. The minimum of this education can never be less than such as is sufficient to qualify each citizen for the civil and social duties he will be called to discharge. The will of God is conspicuously manifested in the order of nature and in the relations which he has established among men, finds the right of every child that is born into the world to see a degree of education as will enable him and, as far as possible, will predispose him to perform all domestic, social, civil and moral duties upon the same clear ground of natural law and equity as it finds a child's right upon his first coming into the world to distend his lungs with a portion of the common air or to open his eyes to the common light or to receive that shelter, protection and nourishment which are necessary to the continuance of his bodily existence. No one man or any one generation of men has any such title to or ownership in these ingredients and substantiate of all wealth that his rights is invaded when a portion of them is taken for the benefit of posterity. This great principle of natural law may be illustrated by reference to some of the unstable elements in regard to which each individual's right of property is strongly qualified in relation to his contemporaries even while he has the acknowledged rights of possession. While a stream is passing through my lands, I may not corrupt it, 
nor divert it to any other direction. Part and parcel of this thinking was man's assumption. If God is our Father, all men must be our brethren. His ideology is so thoroughly the reigning thought of the 20th century and so axiomatic to the contemporary mind that it seems almost too familiar to describe. This all-powerful natural law implants a powerful, all-mastering instinct of love in the parental and especially in the maternal breast to anticipate the idea of duty and to make duty delightful. Thus, not original sin, but natural law and its implanted sense of duty and joy in duty reigns in men. Why then crimes? Failure to educate, failure to utilise this natural law lead to the social diseases known as ignorance, crime and poverty. These things are frustrations of natural law and hence alien to man's nature. Education works with natural law and in harmony with man's basic nature rather than against his nature as Calvinism asserts with its doctrine of total depravity. In education, therefore, motives are everything. Motives are everything. Since duty and a delight in duty is native to man, and goodness also, an appeal to rewards and punishments frustrates true education and is rarely to be resorted to, except in the most extreme cases. Teachers and parents, by rewarding good behaviour, pervert their children. They hire them to go to school and learn, to go to church and remember the text, and to behave well before company by a promise of dainties. Every repetition of this enfeebles the sentiment of duty through its inaction while it increases the desire for delicacies by its exercise, and as they successively come into competition afterwards, the virtue will be found to have become weaker and the appetite stronger. Such parents touch the wrong pair of nerves, the sensual instead of the moral, the bestial instead of the divine. These springs of action lie at the very extremes of human nature, one class down among the brutes, the other up among the seraphim. When a child so educated becomes a man, and circumstances make him the trustee or fiduciary of the friendless and unprotected, and he robs the widow and orphan to obtain the means of luxury or voluptuousness, we exclaim, poor human nature, and are ready to appoint a fast. When the truth is, he was educated to be a knave under that very temptation. Were a surgeon to operate upon a human body, with as little knowledge of his subjects as this, and whip round his double-edged knife where the vital parts lie thickest, he would be tried for manslaughter at the next court, and deserve conviction. It was upon these principles that the professional training of public school teachers was established, and modern educational theory is the direct outcome of these ideas. As against the Calvinist conception of man as sinner, man is good, as against the doctrine of man's responsibility and accountability to God, of life as a stewardship, the Non-biblical conception of natural rights is introduced into education. The pupil is therefore a person with rights rather than responsibilities. Instead of being accountable to God, parents, teachers and society, the pupil can assert that God, parents, teachers and society are responsible to him. In this conception, nurtured by normal school principles, and germinating in the 19th century, lie the essentials of Dewey's educational philosophy and progressive education. The doctrine of the natural rights of man involve a democratization of rights which destroy all other standards save the will of man, thus ultimately destroying man's freedom in subservience to the common will. The opposition to rewards and punishment is significant, for man, punishment excited fear, and fear is a most debasing, dementalizing passion. 
When Scripture declares, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and notes that while such fear sometimes indeed checks the growth of vice, it has, at the same time, a direct tendency to check the growth of every virtue. The fear of bodily pain is a degrading motive, but we have authority for saying that where there is perfect love, every known law will be fulfilled. It has been seen that man regards this concept of education as an appeal to the divine rather than the bestial in man. Here again an important aspect of man's anthropology appears, the divinity in men. God, being divine, needs no motive outside of himself. He is self-contained and self-sufficient. He is responsible to none, accountable to none, and has no value or standard other than himself. Every doctrine of man which asserts or implies his divinity strives to give man this same divine autonomy. Rewards and punishments are tokens of external authority and of accountability. If man is responsible to God, then his sense of duty and his sense of satisfaction are dependent on his relation to God, on his rewards and punishments received from the sovereign God who is arbiter of all his life. If man is a creature of the state, then his sense of duty and satisfaction are dependent on his relation to the state, as Marxist theory asserts, and rewards and punishments must be forthcoming. Men must be sent to slave camps or be proclaimed people's heroes. When man asserts his divinity and his natural rights, then he must either be an anarchist or assert a community of rights and a socialising of man in order to direct and coalesce his common body of divinity and rights. The result is a sovereign and deified state which punishes citizens who fail to understand their rights and rewards those who exalt the common divinity, the common will. The parenthood of the state was a familiar idiom in man's thinking. Even as much earlier, the motherhood of the church had been used to assert the nursing rights of that institution over men. Society, in its collective capacity, is a real, not a nominal sponsor and godfather for all its children. It is a common assumption that the progressive educational concept of educating the whole child rather than giving the fundamentals or the three R's dates from Dewey. Rather, it dates from man and from every attempt to claim the child for the state. In the education of a human being, all his powers are to be regarded. When the perfection of a work depends upon the proportion and harmony of its parts, the absence of any part defeats the whole. It was only a question of time before the state's claim to the child and the doctrine of natural rights led to progressive education. Indeed, man believed, the fundamental maxim of true education is not so much to inculcate opinions and beliefs as to impart the means of their formation. For man, any democratic concept of education rested on three principles of natural ethics. The successive generations of men, taken collectively, constitute one great commonwealth. The property of this commonwealth is pledged for the education of all its youth up to such a point as will save them from poverty and vice and perhaps to prepare them for the adequate performance of their social and civil duties. The successive holders of this property are trustees bound to the faithful execution of their trust by the most sacred obligations and embezzlement and pillage from children and descendants have not less of criminality and have more of meanness than the same offences when perpetrated against contemporaries. These principles man saw in progress in Massachusetts. Massachusetts is parental in her government. More and more, as year after year rolls by, she seeks to substitute the prevention for the remedy and rewards for penalties. Here we see again two basic principles. First, 
the state can reward because the state, as collective man, is not an alien principle as is God, for whom such principles mean an appeal to fear. Man, while opposing parental, scholastic, and religious rewards and punishment ethics, was ready to condone it and indeed insist on it in the state. For him, compulsory education, which involved coercion and fear of punishment for failing to educate one's children, was beyond question. Rewards and punishment ethics were basic to establishing the state's power and school law. When the successive generations of men are one great commonwealth, the internal affairs of that organism do not constitute an external application of fear and compulsion. It is a matter of internal and natural necessity. Second, natural law gives property ultimately to this body, the commonwealth or state, and the state thus exercises the natural rights of the individual by its sovereign actions. Much of the drift to socialism in Western culture ascribed so exclusively to Marxist influence is clearly and definitely to be traced to the natural rights and natural law doctrines. The state thus is the basic institution and therefore the basic educational institution. Not only that, but moral education is also its basic concern and the Sabbath school, the pulpit and so forth are cooperative or auxiliary institutions. Certainly the schools had as part of their curriculum in those days moral instruction and Bible reading. Man had more than this in mind. Education would result in such moral improvements that vice and crime would be eradicated. Education led to self-reformation. Knowledge is not only power but moral virtue. For him, Education is not only a moral renovator and a multiplier of intellectual power, but the most prolific parent of material riches. The millennium of Christian hope is to be obtained by means of education, which, so far as human agency is concerned, must be looked to for the establishment of peace and righteousness upon earth and for the enjoyment of glory and happiness in heaven. Education can become the most effective and benignant of all the forces of civilization, for two reasons. First, it has a universality of operation, and second, the materials upon which it operates are so pliant and ductile. As the child is father to the man, so may the training of the schoolroom expand into the institutions and fortunes of the state. What Paley so justly said of a parent that to send an uneducated child into the world is little better than to turn out a mad dog or a wild beast into the streets. It's just as true when applied to parliament and hierarchy as when applied to an individual. For in the name of the living God it must be proclaimed that licentiousness shall be the liberty and violence and chicanery shall be the law and superstition and craft shall be the religion and the self-destructive indulgence of all sensual and unhallowed passions shall be the only happiness of that people who neglect the education of their children. To read man, the issue was ostensibly education or no education. Actually, the issue was between state-controlled education and community-controlled education, and this was the basic issue. Man's work was twofold. First, to secularise education, and second, to make it the province of the state rather than the community and parents. An educational historian has aptly summarised his work. According to Coverley, first, man changed the function of education from mere learning or religiously oriented education to social efficiency, civic virtue and character. Second, he transferred control of community schools into state hands. That mere learning as an object of education perished as long as it did, almost 80 years beyond man's day, was due to the fact that rural America made difficult the purposes envisioned by man's presuppositions. The urbanization of America destroyed the isolation of American communities and supplanted 
mere learning with social efficiency and civic virtue. Character by this time ceased to be a concern. Education had not been neglected previously. It had been more limited in time, but more intensive in nature. As man himself noted, so seriously was responsibility to educate regarded that in both the old colonies of Plymouth and of Massachusetts Bay, if a child over 16 and under 21 years of age committed a certain capital offence against father or mother, he was allowed to arrest judgment of death upon himself by showing that his parents, in the language of the law, had been very unchristianly negligent in his education. All this man admired in his forebears, a progress now required secularization and state control. For man, a republic's security rested in morality and intelligence, both the products of education. Education is the cure-all for sin and for the weaknesses of nature. Defective education or the lack of any education are the causes of mob violence and such irresponsible revolutions as that in France. The mobs, the riots, the burnings, the lynchings perpetrated by the men of the present day are perpetrated because of their vicious or defective education when children. Education is to inspire the love of truth as the supremest good and to clarify the vision of the intellect to discern it. A love of truth, a love of truth. This is the pool of moral Bethesda, whose waters have miraculous healing. To make this true education possible, two grand qualifications are equally necessary in the education of children, love and knowledge. Without love, every child would be regarded as a nuisance and cast away as soon as born. Without knowledge, love will ruin every child. He spoke of teaching as an actual predestination of what the rising generation shall be. What it would predestine is a new earth, paradise restored to a large measure. The common school is the greatest discovery ever made by man. Other social organisations are curative and remedial. This is a preventative and an antidote. They come to heal diseases and wounds, this to make the physical and moral frame invulnerable to them. Let the common school be expanded to its capabilities. Let it be works with the efficiency of which it is susceptible, and nine-tenths of the crimes in the penal code would become obsolete. The long catalogue of human ills would be abridged. Men would walk more safely by day. Every pillow would be more inviolable by night. Property, life and character held by a stronger tenure all rational hopes respecting the future brightened. Here we have two basic claims of professional educators now long familiar. First, we are the agency which can change society and create a true utopia, paradise on earth, and second, let it be worked with efficiency, that is, give us the money and we can do it. Our failure thus far is your fault in that we have received insufficient funds. The common schools were thus the cure-all for sin and crime. Education meant moral reformation, moral virtue, knowledge cured sin. Teach physiology, man asserted, and youth will be less tempted by gin, swearing and tobacco. Man's liberal doctrine of man appeared again in his conflicts with the Boston schoolmasters, who faithful to their Puritan tradition and academic approach, declared that duty should come first and pleasure should grow out of it. Involved in this concept is the Calvinist doctrine of man as sinner and accountable to God. For man, the pleasure-promoting principle was paramount. Affection first, then duty. Methods were more important than subject matter because the person, not the subject matter, was paramount, and the person was one endowed with rights and thus destined to receive rather than to produce. Reisman, Glazer and Denny, in their analysis of The Lonely Crowd, 1950, 
have emphasized the shift from production-centered and morality-centered character to consumer-centered and group-oriented character. This antithesis was present in the conflict between man and the schoolmasters. Man's concept of education was clearly messianic as well, and his language self-consciously echoes biblical salvationist phraseology. Education is the Messiah. The question for us is, has not the fullness of time now come? In 1823 at Dedham, in his 4th of July address, he declared, Intelligence, like the blood sprinkled upon the doorposts of the Hebrew houses, will prevent the destroying insult of despotism from entering. The State Board of Education, newly organised and with man its first secretary, in approving library books, be it not truth but common consent the criterion, its principles of operation were thus in harmony with the man creed. On March 7th, 1840, in another context, the Committee on Education of the House of Representatives reported that the operations of the board were incompatible with the principles on which the common schools are founded and maintained. Nothing could have been truer or more emphatically denied. They found man looking to foreign schools including those of Prussian statism as his patterns, these schools being alien to the American situation, having been devised more for the purpose of modifying the sentiments and opinions of the rising generation according to a certain government standard than as a mere means of diffusing elementary knowledge. Man, however, won the day, and his victory has been so complete that even his biographer Williams Professor of Education at Heidelberg College, Tiffin, Ohio, a church-related institution, sings the praises of man. The Christians are in man's camp now. His alien standards have become the American educational creed, and his concept of state education has supplanted the community education of his day. The common school has become the state school, maintaining only the facade of a local board, with increasing pressure at present to abolish this last bulwark of the community against the state. It should be noted that man strongly insisted on the need for more Bible in the schools than existed in his day. He was ready to defend its value and necessity with documented testimonies of its effect on the lives of students, but it should be noted that man was not interested in the Bible as a means towards promoting godliness, but rather social efficiency. Religion should be used because it is productive of civic virtue. Social orientation was everything. Man's basic principle was the pragmatic use of religion. The basic reference in religion is therefore not to God but to society. The messianic character of education has not changed. It has only expanded its scope and accordingly, its claims to support financial and intellectual. Sex education, counselling, psychological testing, psychiatric aid, all these things are added in the abiding conviction that knowledge is not only power, but moral virtue. Given these things and more, it is asserted the new society will be created. Meanwhile, social disintegration grows more rapidly The doctrine of universal human rights ends in the mutual cancellation of rights in either social anarchy or the surrender of rights to the mass man, to the state. Democracy always perishes from an overdose of democracy. Standards perish before majority rule. The group morale outweighs morality. The insistence on rights nullifies the doctrine of responsibility. Man was pious and believed himself to be a true Christian, but by interpreting Christianity as freedom and education as salvation, he undercut both Christianity and the Republic. Since his day, Unitarianism has repudiated Christianity and become generally religious, seeing good in all religions in terms of its basic convictions. This is an honest step. And in terms of man's presuppositions, What he envisioned was a new religion, with the state as its true church and education as its messiah. 
Man's errors were to make this implicit faith explicit 